it's sort of difficult to talk uh, about this topic, Blackfoot physics, because um, well, I had a, I really it was the most difficult book for me to write because um, I really I was going entering into somebody else's world, and that a, a lot of non-native people had written books uh, about Native Americans that caused a lot of offense. You know, but again, it's another example of colonialism. You know, that you you take you take something and you don't give it back. And uh, you know, I had a lot of difficulties whether whether I should be writing the book and whether it was right, whether I could write it, and what on earth did I know about it anyway? Uh, you know, was a, I mean, I couldn't speak their language, which is, is really the barrier to knowing a per people to speak their language. Uh, there's an excuse of sorts that I give in the book, and that is um, when I went out to the Sundance, I stayed with, with a family, and the mother was saying how the kids went to school at the local school, and, and I'd heard these sort of stories in a lot of other places, how, how the children really... Um, wanted to um, really forget about their culture. They wanted to dismiss their culture. They didn't want to be Indians. They wanted to be like white people because there was nothing of value in their culture. You know, their culture was, was, was Indians are drunk and, and lazy and they're violent towards their wives and uh, they produce nothing, they're savages. You know, these are the sort of stereotypes that the kids get in school from other kids. Um, and they really wanted to forget, you know, to forget about who they were and, 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 and sort of make a dislocation of their culture. And, and at the time I was say I was talking about how, how uh, you know, the, the, the deep um, insights their culture was giving me into into some of my, the ideas from my culture, my ideas of physics, how, how deep they were, you know, how profound they were. And she said, oh, if only you could tell people that, you know, that sort of thing, then somehow my, my, my children would have a sense that, that, that there was something worthwhile in their culture. Because you're a scientist and we look up to scientists. And, so that, that's sort of a, a bit of an excuse for writing the book, but I don't know um, if it's a totally valid one. I, I still have to wrestle with my conscience about this book and about talking about these things. Um, no, because I'm not an anthropologist. And, and really what happened was that I didn't seek them, that they sought me. That um, uh, A woman called Pam Colorado and a man called Leroy Little Bear asked me to come to a gathering where they had some native elders who wanted to speak to Western scientists because they really felt the key to that they didn't understand the Western people. They said, "You guys came 500 years ago, and we tried to talk to you, and you wouldn't listen." And, and, and all this terrible mess followed from it. And our elders say, "It's time to try a second time. It's time to talk to you again." They had a certain prophecy uh, about the seventh fire that 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 um, and these prophecies you find all over North America that that that, that the nature is going to have a great renewal. There's going to be a great renewal. It's going to take place fairly soon. And the way nature may renew herself is just to cleanse her body, we'll get rid of all the like, little mites and ticks and human beings on the surface, start again. There's a possibility we can all survive this. And the, the story was that, that the fire has to be lit by the four colors. There are four races, the red, the yellow, the blue race, which is the black people, and the white race. And if this fire can be lit, we can all light it together, then there's a possibility this renewal can take place in, in a less uh, painful way. So they said it's time to talk to you again. And they, they thought that the people that probably represented the Western mind the most were the scientists. So they felt it was important to talk to the scientists. Uh, and particularly because they'd heard things about quantum physics and about that we didn't see, we didn't believe in tables anymore, we said they're all waves, and they really liked all of that. So. <laughs> So that was the invitation to go and talk, and out of that came many, many meetings, and uh, and finally this book. And I was trying to think of an image. I was really uh, grappling how, how to express this, and I thought of, I mean, like meeting someone who who you can sit down and have a meal with this person, and these this person has lives in a totally different world than you do. And and and, and of course, I realize that you're a therapist, so probably you do you do occasionally meet patients like that. The people who live in a profoundly different world than you do, but you can sit down and eat, you know, eat a meal with them. And as as one of the elders said to me, you know, white people have come and with, they've married and they've had children. So it's possible for people who have profoundly different realities to, to, to sit down and have a meal together, to, you know, to get married and have children together. And I, I was wondering what it is. And, 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 I, and, you know, Christopher and I talked a little bit about this, about the persuasiveness of Western reality, and, and, and it began to occur to me, it's not the objects, we all agree on the objects, the chair and the table, it's somehow the, the meaning that lies between them and their relationships that's different. 
And I think for the Blackfoot, it's the meaning that is profoundly different than ours. So, so we can both function in the same physical world, but, but the meaning of their world is profoundly different. The cracks, you know, the cracks between things are profoundly different for, for them than they are for us. And I think that's where they... I, and so what happened was I tried to go into their world. Um, I couldn't go in as an anthropologist because I, I couldn't study. You know, I didn't want to go and study people or, or, or you know, or try, to, try to, to understand them. I wanted to essentially be with them and talk to them and try and see what their world was. And then as I began to have some vague inkling of maybe I, I could see something, you know, try to talk to them and see if I could make sense. And then to come back to my world and see how profoundly different my world looked. And I think that's been the big lesson that I really don't know anything about the Blackfoot, but I can come back and see how much um, the world I live in is a social construct and, and, and how much of it is constructed by the language we all speak. You know, we all speak Indo-European <laughs> languages. We all speak strongly noun-based languages. We all deal in concepts and categories. And to try and spend time with another people who don't live in such a world at all. They live in a profoundly different world. It, it really, the instruction was then to come back to my world and see, gee, you know, how much of it is constructed? How much of the, the how much have we, have we pasted over these little cracks between things? And uh, so, so we, may, we have a nice continuity of reality, but, but really it's not like that at all. So uh, I think it's made me maybe, that's been the value for me, is to, is to see that meaning. So the, maybe to talk a little bit, that's a preface to it. Uh, gee, is there anything else? <laughs> uh, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, to realise that that somehow this is so pervasive. You see, really, when we when we went over to North America, we, we took this worldview with us, and we thought inevitably things like justice systems and and, and uh, legal systems, systems of governance, are somehow had an inevitability about them, and they're all you know. But 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 really, you realise again how how much they are dependent on a whole set of assumptions, and that you realize how profoundly different the Native American system is. So I'm going to potentially talk about the Blackfoot, and this is a map of Canada, you see, and North America. In fact, I was very good at O-level geography, but we did Australia. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't do North America, and you notice too that, Ke that, that Quebec is separated. In this okay, the, Black the Blackfoot live here, uh, they live on the edge of the Rockies. Okay, they live here, and um, there are also the Cheyenne down here. Who these people all speak the Algonquin family of languages. So you go here, here the Blackfoot, and then you come up here, and there are all around here are the Ojibwe, and up here are the Cree, and they all speak the same family of languages, the Algonquin. Uh, and then you keep on going, and then up here are the Naskapi, which uh, Marie von Franz refers to in her book, but she has a Naskapi living over here, which they don't, they live over here. <laughs> so she has an error, yeah. The Naskapi live over here. She has that one about the dream of the man who, who, uh, who dreamt of a stranger sleeping with his wife. I don't know if you rem anybody remember that here. <coughs> That's the Naskapi. And over here are the Mi'kmaq. So these people all speak the same family of languages. And the other, the, the, main, the other interesting thing is that they have the creator. The trickster and creator is Napi. Here, here is Napi, N-A-P-I. And he's the old man. Napi is the old man. And in fact, uh, the rivers there, there's the old man river, the chin river, the belly buttes, that, they, that the creator's body is in the landscape. And in fact, if you draw out these things, you actually see the creator. So Napi walked here and created the land. Then he moved up here and he became Nanabush for the Ojibwe and created the Ojibwe's land. And he moved up here and became finally an Anabozo for the, for the, um, for the Naskapi. So this is an enormous journey of 3,000 miles. The creator moved through all of this and created the land and the people. And there, there are these wonderful uh, stories of uh, Napi stories or Nanabush and Anabozo stories. Um, and they're really about the way the land was created and also the creation of consciousness. So, you know, if anybody gets hold of it, this thing, book called like Blackfoot Lodge Stories, but there are many books. Do you realize it's in a sense a creation of, 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 of the consciousness of the society, the evolution of consciousness from, from its very embryo uh, in, into, into sort of differentiation? There are really remarkable stories. Uh, and it's interesting that, that he is the creator of everything, yet in a sense uh, the world already exists when he comes along. So it's a strange sort of creation. He created everything, but the world's already there. Sometimes he's said to have given things names. And Nappy's also the trickster. 
and uh, I mean, this is he is the creator. He is the original uh, origin of all. And also this creation seems to be still going on because things have to constantly be renewed. You see, the, the thing with, 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 with the Blackfoot is that everything is flux. The world is flux. There are no objects. There's nothing constant. And, and everything has to be renewed. And in the distant past, the ancestors made compacts with the powers and energies of the universe, which enable us to live in harmony. And these have to be renewed through sacrifice and ritual. But nappies are created, but then there are these stories you see about the creator which are so nice because there's a, a nappy story where nappies, this old old man, and he sees this beautiful young woman who's got incredible breasts. And he thinks, oh, these are so fantastic breasts. I really got to get have a go with these. So he becomes a sm small baby, you see, and the woman sees him, picks up, takes him in the tent, and, and so the nappy lies on the, on, on, on the one's breast, starts to suck the breast, and he gets so turned on he forgets about his transforming, he becomes an old man again. <laughs> <laughs> and she screams and all the young men come into the tent and beat him up and throw him out of the village. So it's nice that you have a story of the creator, where the creator is also the fool and the trickster. So, so many of these stories tell you about boundaries. They're telling you about boundaries, where to draw the boundary, where things are. Um, how far can consciousness move? What what is its flexibility? <coughs> what can we do? What about identity? A lot of stories about identity. Everything's always transforming in the stories, like people do. You see, you, I mean, when you're born, you have a certain you have a name, and then you later on given another name. So your identity is a constantly in a state of transformation. Nothing's constant. <coughs> not like not like our world. But anyway, those are the, those are nappy stories. And remember that, that, that it's a story also of the land. The land is Nappy's body. And the Blackbird always say you have respect. You walk with bare feet because you're walking on the mother's flesh when you walk on the land. So there, there are many stories like that. And the interesting thing is that Nappy did this trip and the sort of consciousness did this trip right up, right up to the extreme point of Labrador or consciousness or Nappy or whatever you call it. There are also other nice stories. Nappy is a bit like uh, Coyote. And a bit like over here, Raven, you know, Raven for the hider. And there are like great coyote stories, which are interesting. I think they're really fascinating because one, a lot of the things coyote tries to do is to try to do good. There are a lot of stories about trying to do good. And, and, and sometimes coyote sees creation on the first day and, and feels that really, um, I couldn't make, you know, it's, it's sad here that the river's running downhill. Why can't it run up uphill as well? So maybe I'll make the river run uphill. Maybe these ducks that are on the river, maybe they'd like to walk on the land instead. Maybe the fish would like to climb trees. So he tries to do the very best thing and help all creation. And of course, when he's finished it and he sits back, he's made a terrible mess of everything. Nothing works. So there are many stories about the trickster, the idea of the trickster trying, there's many stories about trying to do good and trying to improve things and trying to help things and how disastrous it is ever to dream of doing that. <laughs> and uh, that is a, a feature that you hear many stories. I mean, uh, the, remember the laughter there, because the next story is about um, a woman who phones the RCMP and say, my son's going to hang himself. He's hanging himself on the tree outside. And the, uh, the RCMP officer says, well, can you stop him? And she says, no, that's what he's decided to do. So the son hanged himself, but she just told him. This is what happened. So, so this is another story I was told about a man uh, who was a, um, a fishing guide and his son was learning to be a guide. And uh, they had a very expensive boat with people in it. And the son was going very fast towards some rocks. And uh, the father sat in the back, didn't say anything. And the, the white man thought, why does the father not say anything? You know, why doesn't he want his son? And at the last minute, the son saw the rocks, but the father would never have intervened, never would have told the son. The son had to learn. Had to, so, so those are things that were very difficult for us to maybe comprehend. We, we would tend to think of like helping people, of, of <laughs> guiding people, of giving them the benefit of our wisdom. But this is very, very different. And there's so many stories like the one of the suicide, so many stories where uh, a person seems to be heading towards disaster. and. Uh, other people will say, you know, we can't intervene. If they asked, if someone came and asked for help, even asking for help would be so difficult. Uh, I mean, the stories you hear, stories about, uh, I had a friend who was a, um, an RCMP officer and he was trying to reform the, the legal system to make it more in accord. Uh, so he would ask the elders, what would you do in this position? And the elder would tell a completely irrelevant story. And it took him about two years to realize that you can't ask those sort of questions. You have to somehow learn what it is you have to do. 
but you can't be asking for help and you can't be asking for guidance. So it's a very different, it's a very different world. The um, so the thing about these lang oh <coughs> yeah okay what well, just to fill in you know just to, to fill it's the interesting thing is a Micmac here were one of the first people to have contact with white people and the Blackfoot over here were one of the last so Leroy Little Bear's grandfather didn't know any had not seen white people when he was a young young man and the Micmacs actually had a, were there for so long they had a concordance with the Pope they're one of the few people before any treaties were ever signed with. Uh, with any kings, they said, who was the boss in Europe? And they were told the Pope. So they have a direct concordance with the Pope and they have their own representative in the, the Vatican. It's very strange. Over here, you know, you have, a, you have a different system. The Blackfoot are called the ancient ones because they were always there. The groups out of the side had come in and migrated, but the, the Blackfoot were always there. The Blackfoot hunt buffalo. They don't follow the buffalo. This is it, you know, it's interesting. You tend to think you hunt the buffalo means you follow the buffalo. What happens really is the buffalo and the Blackfoot are engaged in a cosmic dance in a way. And you also hear some hunters say, you don't hunt the animal, you have to be there when the animal arrives. You meet the animal at the designated place. So a lot of this would happen in dreams or in the sweat lodge. If you were, say people killing a bear would go in the sweat lodge <coughs> and, and undergo purification and dreams. And the, and the, the bear would be killed in these dreams. And then the, then the next day, the actual physical act is really only a pale reflection of what's of the reality that's always taken already taken place. So it would be very similar with hunting the buffalo. That where does the hunt take place? Where does it exist? Uh, is it a physical action or is it a spiritual action? And they, they, they are, are only allowed to hunt the buffalo because they, the Sioux have given them permission. The Sioux were visited by buffalo calf woman. Maybe you know the story. The buffalo calf woman appeared. This very beautiful woman, and two braves approached her. One of them had lust and was just turned into dust and bones, and the other one was respectful. And buffalo calf woman gave the gifts to the Sioux, to the Lakota people. She gave the gift of the pipe and, and the gift of giving names and various other ceremonies. So, uh, because of buffalo, because of the relationship with buffalo calf woman, the Lakota or the Sioux are allowed to hunt the buffalo. The Blackfoot are not, and they, they are given the buffalo's horns symbolically by <coughs> the Lakota, and that would enable them to, in, in, to engage in hunting. So every year at the Great Sundance, the, the Horn Society, the society that, uh, uh, that really oversee the Sundance, but the Sundance can only take place after the Women's Society is met. So the women really have their meeting, and only when the time is right do they remove their teepee, and then the Horn Society set up their teepee in the centre of the Sundance ground, and then they will meet for several days, and then the Sundance will take place. So that's um, the really the the uh, sanction comes from the women, <coughs> and the authority from the men who have been given it from by, by the Sioux. The other the important thing about the the relationships between all these people is their language, which is the the Algonquin family of languages, which is a verb based language. Some of the verbs have a thousand different endings. They're incredibly, it's an incredibly complicated language. It's essentially a verbal language. So the Algonquin language doesn't have in it, uh, nouns are really derived out of verbs. And a friend of mine, Sargage Henderson, who's a Mi'kmaq, says, I can spend a whole day without ever thinking a noun. <coughs> so I'm thinking processes all the time. I'm thinking movement and flux and process. I'm not thinking objects. So just think, if you, if you don't have any nouns, you don't have any concepts anymore. <coughs> you don't make boundaries in thought. You don't use Aristotelian logic. Uh, I mean, I, I wish I could get... I, I'm just, you know, I, so I realize that as I'm talking, I feel very inadequate. I'm just issuing a lot of words to you. But, you know, when, I, when you sat down with people like that, it is such an amazing experience because you try to talk to them. I mean, I talked to Leroy and I'd ask him a question. He'd go, he'd sing like to himself. And he'd say, well, in our language, I would say, not go, not go, or something like that. And that would mean, uh, and he'd try, really grope to try to tell me what that idea was. I mean, one idea was, was how are you connected? And the, uh, this is what people say when they meet. And it would be the idea of a rope and, and something between us, but it's, a, but it's not really a rope, it's a process between us. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing would be making a mark. And this would be the notion that everything is flux, everything is change. 
And what you can do is make a little mark in this flux. That's the most you can do. So uh, I'm, I'm uttering words to you, but when I sat with the people, it was like, it was the singing and telling a story and trying to grope for a way of speaking in English. As you say, when I speak English, I put on a straight jacket. That's what they would say. I put it, it's like putting on a straight jacket to speak English. And that I, in my own language, I go for a whole day without ever speaking a noun. And so we don't have a concept. Uh, we don't have fish. You know, the Micmacs don't have any fish. What do you have? You know, you know about trout. Yeah, we know about trout. No, no, this. Well, but what is a fish? Well, a fish is a process in the water. And what about trees? Well, how do you name trees? Well, it's the sound the wind makes in the fall as it goes through the leaves. That the leaves are starting to dry and, and there's a certain sound made. And this tree has that sound, that tree has this sound. And somebody actually asked them, what about after acid rain? Have the sound of the, have the name of the trees changed because of acid rain? And they say, well, we must ask our elders about that. You know, that's interesting, maybe they have. And it's the salt wind coming off the sea, going through the trees. So, so, so there is no concept of tree. There's no concept of bone. Uh, you know, if you say, well, what is that? You say, well, that's a part of an animal. But there's no concept there's no generic concept of bone or fish or trees. So, I mean, try, it would be interesting to try and think, to try and think what it would be like to live in a world in which you don't create concepts, in which objects are not primary. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, when you have this bone and you ask them, what does the bone mean? They say, well, this, I carry this with me because this connects me with the animal. Or re rather, it connects me with the keeper of the animal the keepers of the animal, and I have these feathers because they connect me. Uh, and then when you press and press and press, I mean, your answer you get is very like Bohm's implicate order. It's very close. I don't know if people know Bohm's implicate order, but, but the answer you get if really pressed would be a very close one to this, that contained within... Know. Can you say... Can you well, Bohm, Bohm, David Bohm said that really, essentially, uh, the physics, you know, Newtonian physics dealt with, with an explicate order world, what he called an explicate order world, a world of chairs and tables and objects. And our language deals with nouns and, and concepts. It deals with an explicate sort of external surface order. But below that, there's, there's what's called an implicate order. He postulated or enfolded order. And where, where everything is contained within everything else, in a sense. Uh, so what they would say is really within this bone is contained, is contained all, all, all the animals. And, and within this bone, I ha if I have this bone, I'm somehow in contact with the keeper of the animals. <coughs> so that would be the way, and when you impress them, how is it? It would be very close to what Baum says was the implicate order. And the nice thing was just before he died, a few months before he died, Baum did meet with this group of people, with the Blackfoot, and we talked about these. So when I say it's like David Baum, as much as David Baum went into it, it was a very similar answer to the way he saw it. And he'd, his dream had always been, Baum's uh, notion had been that we've entered this world of quantum theory, in which um, the distinction between observer and observed has gone, in which objects dissolve into processes, and we need a new language. And, and Bohm had developed what he called the real mode. And as he sat with the Algonquin people, and they explained to him that our language was created by the ancestors for uh, making alliances with the spirits and energies of the world. This is, and our language, if you ask what our science is or our philosophy is, it is our language. The language contains everything, it's all within the language. That, that the greatest creation or the greatest work of art is the language itself. And when pressed, you know, that he realized the language was very close to the vision he had had of, of a real mode, of a language which would express quantum reality. So it's very curious that this group of people um, who lived a very harmonious, uh, gentle life, you know, uh, did have a language which is very, very close to the one that seems the way, if we wanted to penetrate into the meaning of the quantum world, we'd, we'd have to have this sort of a, a process-based language. So for them, the, the, the world is very much like uh, Whitehead's process and reality or Heraclitus. It's a world of flux and change, and the language expresses that flux. And so what can you do in the flux is, is if you live in flux, uh, also, what is the world? Well, well, all of this really this explicate order is, is a very tiny fragment of what of what reality is reality really is is the powers and energies that animate and they can be you know you can see them in dreams but remember that the dreams aren't necessarily individual personal things the dreams are you know usually collective 
It's not unusual for people to sit and one person say, I had this dream, and another one would amplify on it with his dream. That the dreams seem to be, be shared dream, particularly when going hunting. Um, that the, the dreams would be to get taken together. They'll present where we have to go, what we're going to encounter, what we're going to see. That there are three strangers coming, and four or five day, days later, the three strangers will, will arrive. <coughs> so the, this 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 is pretty commonplace to have those sort of a dreams as as a group. <coughs> Maybe I could say a little bit about about the, the notion of of. of individual psychology because there doesn't seem to be any I mean first of all you're immersed in a language and a language of flux and and we say we have this language because um, we have made alliances with um, with the with the powers or energies of the universe you call them spirits whatever you want to call them or keepers of the animals and nothing lasts forever everything will be swept away so we have to constantly renew those alliances so uh, we as members of the group have obligations to perform rituals to carry out the sun dance which we carry out for the, the whole of the cosmos to burn tobacco to open sacred bundles to do various things many of which require sacrifice i mean they talk people talk about a rain dance and, and what you're asking is is the clouds coming out we ask the cloud to sacrifice part of its being and in return the cloud will make a demand on us for a sacrifice if we want to hunt the buffalo, there has to be an exchange. Everything has to be an exchange. There has to be a balance or a harmony. So everything must be exchanged. Everything, and, and we must constantly renew everything. A friendship, um, a, a sacred compact. Um, so, for example, these, these are not uh, Algonquin people, but, but the Mohawk here, when they plant corn, they have to carry out, do the sacred peach game, because that renews their compact. You see, the Mohawk, Originally, they said the corn came from Central America. This is an amazing, you know, this is an amazing thing that corn and rice and wheat all came around about the same time. These three grasses mutated in different parts of the world, around about the same time. And the corn came here because of compacts people had with nature, with the corn god. We made alliances with the corn god and the corn was given to us. And uh, one of the people who took the corn up here were the, were the Mohawk, the Iroquois people. And so they made the journey through the Ohio Valley where you see these big mounds. And everywhere they came, they stopped so they could introduce the corn to all the other plants. And they'd have to live there for several generations to introduce the corn, and then they could move further up. All of which makes very good ecological sense. <coughs> but there's a certain obligation because of the corns given to us. We have an obligation every year when we plant the corn to carry out this sacred game. And it's a gambling game played, played with peach stones. And the result of the game says if the men come to plant the corn or the women. And the joke always says if it's the men win, it's going to be a rotten crop that year. <laughs> <laughs> but that's interesting that, 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 that the way of renewing a sacred, um, a sacred pledge is through gambling. So, uh, I mean, I don't know, that must play a big role in Jungian things. I've got another one. This is the one played up here by the Micmac, which is Walter's game. Because uh, Jung talked a lot about the trickster. And synchronicities, synchronicities occurred at the point of when you're about to lose everything. And this, is, this story tells us. Uh, a man, his son had died. And he was very, very attached to him. So he went to the keeper of the animals and said, I would like to bring my son back on Earth. And the keeper said, you can't. That's... Again, a lot of these stories tell you what you can and cannot do when you're crossing a boundary. <coughs> but uh, the man insisted, and, and, and the keeper took so much compassion on him that he said, OK, we'll play, we'll play Walter's game. Walter's game is a very complicated game. It's played with a series of sticks. And uh, I mean, and all the, the objects have a sacred uh, purpose. It's played with sticks, the old man and the old woman. There's one old man and several old women. And there's a, there's, a, there's a bowl with stones are thrown in. It's a gambling game, but a very complicated one because it uses three systems of arithmetic. And as the game changes and progresses, you, 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 develop, you use a different counting system. I don't fully understand. The game can last for several days. It's a very complicated game. And in fact, it was, made, it was outlawed by the Canadian government because the missionaries didn't like the fact that the old man had several wives. So it was thought to lead to promiscuity, and, and uh, until relatively recently, people could be arrested for playing it. And, you know, I mean, they could be arrested, put into prison for playing this game. Just as much as in many places, people could be arrested for praying. Uh, anyway, you play the game. <coughs> the the man played the game with the with the keeper of the animals, and he came. It came to the point where he only had one stone left. He'd lost everything, 
and he gambled everything on the last throw and won everything. And the, uh, the keeper had compassion on him, gave him his son back, but said, you must always play the game. The sacrifices, your people must always play the game now. So the game has to be played. So it's a gambling game, but it's played, it's an important, it has to be played to renew something that happened a long, long time ago. And one feature of the game is the way you win is you accumulate. You accumulate. The other way to win is to lose everything. There's a possibility when you lose everything that you will absolutely win the game. And they call that beating the devil, which is sort of, you know, something that's coming through Christian times. But so there are two ways you can play, you can, you can play to gain, to gain gradually, or you can play to sacrifice everything. And that seems to be true of so many of those. those the, so, so somehow renewing compacts has something to do with gambling and something to do with the possibility of losing everything which you become the absolute winner. And, and I, you know, you can explain all that to me. I don't fully understand the role of the gambling. I don't fully understand it. Uh, that must be my Western conditioning. Why it is so important to have a game of chance to base the deepest, uh, some of the deepest sort of spiritual um, practices, in a sense, on a game of chance. Or I mean, your whole life is the core planting of the corn. That that should be have to be determined by a game of chance. Isn't it the same attitude as the father at the back of the boat that's heading for the? The rapids. It's it's just letting things take their Maybe course. it is. Maybe it's it's it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, allow, it's allowing the flux to operate. Yeah. It's allowing the flux to operate. They don't see it as chance. Uh, I don't know what this this it's it's, it's maybe it's allowing it's allowing nature to yeah. Because the other thing they they talk about it is is that time time is of course is a cycle. Time cyclical, in the flux time, but. It, it's it's going to come back, and and I really pressed Leroy about that. Is the time, does the time actually come back exactly the same way? You know, does it really come back the same? And he asked the elders, and the elders said, well, the time's not the same, but the space is always the same. And this, because the space is the same, we mark it with stones. So that's why you have these these markers in the landscape. That the, the, the markers in the landscape mark the space, but the time the time comes back. Slightly different, but the space is always the same. I don't want to leave that for your understanding. <laughs> sure. um, is there a connection with the potlatch of the, the, uh, of, of the, of the hider over that end? Indians, yeah, I don't. You accumulate everything, then you give it, you all, give it all away. away yeah. And you become the most wealthy person, because the one who's given away the most. That's right. Yeah. It's it's, a, it's about like nothing. yeah it is a, it is like that but I mean I don't know of anything in the Blackfoot nature of, of, of like a potlatch it doesn't seem to be anything yeah. you know in the sense of giving things away I guess it's a different society mm -hmm. uh, it's a hunting society and and the, and the, the 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 hydra are more they live in houses and mm -hmm. the I mean the potlatch they collect copper and things so I guess it's very much determined by the society I think. I want to say a little bit about uh, uh, individual psychology and, and, and bring that from a story here near the coast, which is not Algonquin people. It's the story of one of the people that live near there. Okay, there's um, a man who lives in this group and he, um, he doesn't get on with them. He wants to leave. He wants to be an individual. He wants to be separate. So after a lot of argument, he leaves with his horses and his wives and goes off. The first night, the braves come back and they take his wives away and the man continues on and then the second day they come and take all his horses and he continues walking and then the third day they take all his clothes and he continues walking and then the next day they cut off his arms and he continues going and then like in the Monty Python you know the, when you had the Holy Grail and he cut off his legs uh, which uh, when I first saw I thought gee that sounds a bit of a bloodthirsty story but what you realize the story tells you is is that the more the person abstracts himself from the group, the less of him exists. And another thing they will say that the, the you know, Blackfoot will say, you know, what is the most, do you punish people? Well, no, we don't, you know, and all the rest of it. Well, in the most severe thing, the most serious punishment is banishment. Because if you're banished, you've lost your language. You have to go amongst people who you don't know their language. And you're not talking about going to France, you know, you're talking about going to China. You're talking about leaving this Algonquin family, which is like, this would be equivalent to you, you know, European languages. They're as, as different as, you know, French and, 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 and well, English and, and Spanish, for example. You know, they're different. So you're talking 
but but it's all part of the family. We we can get we could go to Spain, we can go to France, we can get on. But but we're not talking about going to, uh, you know, going to North Africa and speaking an Arabic language or or, or or speaking Chinese. To be banished from the Blackfoot into one of these other groups means essentially that you become a child again. You have to learn. So the concept is but banishment means you become like a baby. You learn a new language, and obviously you. The language you taught wasn't sufficient for you. It, it didn't bring about that transformation. So you have to leave the group and become a baby and learn a new language. So banishment is the most serious uh, punishment there ever could be. And it's also a, re a reforming notion that the idea is by learning a new language, you begin again. And you almost like the slates wiped clean. The language is the consciousness. So by learning a new language, you develop a new consciousness and you become a different person. Um, so the idea then is, is that there isn't such a thing as so much as an individual. Um, and the legal system reflects that. I mean, they were really uh, very uh, puzzled by the idea of when a lot of this uh, discussion on land claims and self-government came up. They're very, very puzzled by the idea of individual rights. They asked, well, what are rights? And they were told the English answer of a famous jurist is the rights of the fence <laughs> you erect around yourself to protect yourself from others. And for the Blackfoot, I mean, how could you ever live without living with other people? Uh, why would you ever want a fence around yourself? And in fact, the Blackfoot don't have any rights. You, you know, you have obligations. You have ways of working within the society, uh, which are determined by the society itself. My friend Leroy uh, is a lawyer, and he was told by the elders, essentially, that, you know, we we see the time when we're going to have to need our own lawyers, we can't rely on the white people, you've got to go and be trained to be a lawyer. And so he said that meant he had to separate himself from the group, that he wasn't allowed to attend the ceremonies anymore, he went to Utah, went to law school, and now he's back uh, and he teaches at the university and he says he was like, the equivalent was the people in the ceremonies who used to, when the sacred ceremonies were, there were always some men on horses that were riding around and protecting the area. So, so they were never allowed to attend the ceremony because they had to work on the periphery. So <clears throat> it's as if the society has said that is your role and you must accept it, uh, which is very different from ours, where, you, where, where we would say, well, what is it you know, I really want to do? What do I want to become? You know, I, want to, I want to have uh, some sort of self-development. The, the, the role seems to be upon working within the group and what does the group expect from you or how do you express yourself. So some people in the group would be, there are people like contraries, the people who would dress backwards and ride the horse backwards and do everything backwards, you know, wash themselves with earth. And, and these f fulfill a function. And there's a famous story when a treaty was written, one of the chiefs put on his clothes backwards and walked backwards into the tent to show that, I mean, not saying, he didn't argue that this was a bad treaty or that this is going to set us back. He, that's, he just dressed and, and acted that way, which is maybe more powerful than, than a sort of intellectual argument. There are also men who behave like women and adopt women's roles. And amongst the Blackfoot, they're considered to be having a special sacred function. So uh, it's almost as, as if within the society, there are certain roles that people have to adopt or have to play out. Then the other role, I suppose, there's no, I don't know of any shamans in, 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 in the Blackfoot. And that's a funny thing because you, like a lot of people want to talk about shamans. And this seemed to be the one thing that no Native American liked, the idea of a shaman. They say it's, it's, it's a, you know, the, the ones who were educated said, look, this is a word that's come from Russia. It has nothing to do with us, from Siberia. It has nothing to do with us. It's not part of our culture. We don't have shamans. The only thing I ever heard of a shaman was I had a friend who was a, uh, Inuit and an Eskimo and his grandfather was the oldest living Eskimo in eastern Canada and he said my grandfather's a healer, he explained my grandfather can heal but he's not a shaman and if something was so serious that the shaman was needed the shaman would appear but you know the shaman isn't a guy who, who sort of sits in a house with the word shaman on the front and the shaman really is feared in many cases and, and you, you do hear that in the Ojibwe. You see, the Ojibwe do have a secret society called the Medawiwan Society, where there are degrees. It's a bit like the Masons. You know. There are certain degrees. You have four, sky, four earth degrees and four sky degrees. And I do know a man who is at the top of the earth degrees and is going into the sky degrees. So the Ojibwe, they're about the only Native American group that do have a secret society and do practice a sort of magic. Uh, but they're, they're viewed with great trepidation. I mean, because the, because the great... Healer does have uh, 
you know, very frightening powers in many ways. I think another characteristic is this idea of the, you know, if you talk about the shame in which they don't, is the idea of the wounded healer. That does seem to be quite, uh, quite common, the people. I mean, Handsome Lake of the, of the Mohawks uh, went into a deep coma for several days. And when he came out, he, he, he said that man had come, he was lying in the bed and men had come to the door and told him to go and take him on this great journey. And when he came back, he said, you must um, uh, sacrifice a white dog and eat, the, eat a white dog. This is a white dog feast. And then for many, many days, he proclaimed the teachings, the Hands on Lakes teachings, which are still practiced today by many of the Mohawk. And, and uh, people, these are passed on, and it takes about a week for someone to recite the Hands on Lake teachings. Then, of course, you probably know about Black Elk, you know, who was the, the Lakota medicine man, who similarly was, was, had a deep illness and uh, a coma and uh, had many visions in that. So it seems as if many of the teachings come in, the, in that way. To special some some people are singled out so uh when the you know natives will say we're generalists they, each one of us can do it can do everything in the group but there do seem to be some people who have very special powers to have special dreams and special visions but generally from what i gather the dreams are all sort of shared communally you know what else they want to want to talk about the map and the mind they could have mentioned but i don't know um I wonder when so soon maybe we could move more into um, into a discussion mode. Sure. Oh, yeah. I just want to make yeah. the, the legal system. I should just mention that because okay. that, that's a nice one. Um, you see, when, when I've been writing, helping to write somebody a book on uh, a sort of encyclopedia on science, and and the more you look at things like our, our Newtonian worldview, the more you see how how much it influences what. It, our legal system came before that, but you must see how it sanctions it. The idea of a of a of a universe um, obeying strict, you know, strict laws in which uh, complexity grows out of simplicity, which is very different than the modern view of science, in which really order emerges out of chaos, and in which systems are self-organizing, and in which laws really are the expression of self-organization. Uh, so you can see how much our legal system, you know, really has to change to, to take um, cognizance of the fact that, that really we have a much more organic vision of the universe. And I think the, the Blackfoot one is a very beautiful one. See, the Blackfoot one, if, if what we would say a crime has been committed, say somebody has stolen horses or somebody's killed someone, what would happen is that the elders would get together with the aggrieved party and the person who was supposed to have committed the crime. And in no sense do they want to try and find out uh, what the facts are. Or what the history because that implies a certain perception of time a certain perception of history a certain perception of causality which is not shared by the blackfoot what they want to get together to do is to see is to see that how can we restore balance and harmony that something has happened within our society that's thrown it out of balance and that these two people here uh seem to be part of it and you know it's not that this man killed this person's husband but that there's an imbalance and these people are involved in this. So they will ask maybe the person who's accused of, in our words, of committing the crime, what act can you do that will restore balance? What action can you take? This is often the way. What action could you take that will restore harmony? And uh, this discussion goes on with the people. And then finally, when some agreement is made, then it's put to the whole group that this is what will happen. This is what, we're, this is what will be done. And then the whole group gives its sanction. And that's what takes place. So the idea of a justice system is, is a system uh, involving a restoration of harmony, which must first of all be worked out with the various parties involved and then given to the whole group. So it's, yeah. it's, it's possessed by the whole group. And I, I think, for me, that's a very interesting way to, to, um, to, bring, about, uh, to bring about justice, that you're not trying to, uh, to, to seek proof or causality. You're seeing ways of restoring balance. Which seems to be the whole nature of the society is how can we retain balance in this flux? It's very delicate, and if we don't, if we're not constantly alert to renewal and sacrifice and spiritual renewal, then the flux will carry us away. So how can we how can we retain a balance in this flux? And the same with with just just to finish yeah. off the same with governance. It's really um, sitting at night 
in the teepee, in the circle, which is the deepest, the most profound experience is to sit at night and everybody to talk in turn. It seems to go around. Each person will speak. And this person here will tell of a very painful thing. Uh, you know, I, I, I have been, you know, drunk and I, I've beaten my son. And the next person will tell a joke. And this person will sing a healing song. And this person will say something else. And, and as you move around, you see somehow consciousness is expressing itself in a collective way. And if this person tells a painful story, we don't all go around and put our arms on and say, oh, I know, you know, we love you. We don't do that. Maybe this person tells a joke. Or this person tells a healing song. Or this person says, you know, well, I've been beating my wife and I've done terrible things. You know, and, 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 and I want to have a pipe ceremony. And so if that happens, then if you ask for a pipe ceremony, then the, per, the pipe carrier then is obliged to perform the ceremony. And the pipe, uh, and what, he will get the, the, the bowl and the stem of the pipe and the sacred tobacco and he will burn sweet grass under the pipe and to purify it. And then somebody will stand at the door of the teepee to close it so nobody can come in. And then when the pipe and the stem are put together, then it, this sacred marriage takes place and the ceremony begins. And the pack of tobacco is put in, it's lit. And then you rotate the pipe three times and I hand it to you and you smoke. And then when you smoke, you'll take the pipe and you hold it to your heart. And you'll say, really, you, you then speak from the heart. And maybe you'll sit, give a song or a prayer or say something very deep to you. And this pipe will go all the way around one time and then two times and three times. And the last thing I did was... Uh, before I left Canada, well, it wasn't the last, but the last meeting I had, we, we did this, and then for three days, and the third day, uh, it came around four times, and the fourth time the feather was passed around, and when it came to me, it was, I was asked to retain the feather, and that when you travel, to take it with you as protection, which was a, a very unexpected <laughs> thing, mm -hmm. which was in some sense a sanction to talk about these things, a little bit of a sanction to yeah. talk about them, yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much, David. We are going to pass around our um, our customary several glasses of wine, yeah. children, and we'll start our discussion again. I've got such a list of things, oh, and I'm sure everyone has in their heads that they want to ask uh, David to amplify.